I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about um, some of the things that are important to us um, in this administration. We're about a year in, and uh, in particular, thinking about sort of inequalities in aging and longevity, and particularly as I think about both the regions of Virginia uh, as well as our, our different populations, I think there are a number of factors. And, and of course, you know, Virginia, like many states, is is pretty diverse as far as um, you know, we have some some large metropolitan areas in in Hampton Roads, Northern Virginia, and Richmond, uh, and Roanoke, and then some very very rural communities, uh, particularly in south Southwest Virginia, Appalachia, things like that. So the issues that we face um, sometimes are pretty consistent, but often are really uh, driven by um, the types of issues that uh, individuals face in those communities, whether it's shortage of service uh, service providers or nonprofits or travel. Uh, Southwest Virginia, for instance, some people drive two and a half hours to go to an OBGYN. So it's, you know, distance as well. Um, but, but really when I think about that, sort of one of the things that comes to me uh, initially is just, we are a very diverse state with a lot of nationalities, probably more so than, than many other states. Um, so the languages that are spoken in Virginia, and particularly how we deliver those from the healthcare perspective, are really, really important. So language access, including um, access for people with disabilities, um, has been a, a critical area for us to, to really think about that. And when I think about, you know, in particular services that are really important um, in Medicaid, uh, you know, we cover a large number of languages that are spoken um, obviously, some of the the ones that you would imagine, but many others, many uh, dialects, uh, and making sure that our managed care providers uh, offer those services is really critical. We've really been trying to ramp that up. Um, it's been especially important. Again, you know, we we sort of came in at at what we hope is the end of COVID, um, but really thinking about um, how we uh, communicate uh, to various populations uh, in. Uh, their own language and using uh, trusted voices, right? I think that's one of the things that we learned during COVID is that there are a lot of people that will listen to a doctor that they don't know, uh, who is in a, a position of authority, whether it's the CDC or NIH or a state health commissioner. But a lot of people really listen to their own providers, their friends, and most importantly, trusted voices. And so thinking about um, not just looking for those trusted voices, particularly in some of these these communities, but thinking about how do we make sure that we have those trusted voices who speak the same language. Um, and so that has been a real focus for us um, as we think about sort of the next stage of um, addressing COVID uh, through this past year. And then just in general, there are a large number of services that that we provide uh, in my secretariat and, and just... Um, you probably should have said this in the beginning, uh, Virginia is organized uh, very similar to the federal government. So all of the agencies um, in state government that cover health and human services, whether it's the health department, behavioral health, Medicaid, um, social services, as well as all the agencies um, that cover uh, individuals with disabilities and, and rehabilitation and things like that, are part of the Health and Human Resources Secretariat. So when I look at language access um, and how it impacts uh, inequalities in the delivery of care and how people um, uh, live in our community, I'm thinking about all of those uh, services. So particularly um, thinking about uh, individuals with disabilities and, and people that uh, uh, do not speak English uh, or uh, English as a second language. So that that has been a really uh, important one. Um, I, I will tell you, I am surprised that it's an issue that we're still dealing with after, you know, many years of having access to, um, you know, companies and services that that can provide translation for us. Um, it's surprising that that state government service, state government still has that need. So that that's been really important. Secondly, and this should be no surprise to anybody that covers health, is just, you know, what, what we have labeled the social determinants of health, um, what I would really call the social determinants of life, and how they play a role in, uh, in just longevity and, and making sure that people um, have access to care. So for me, 
when I think about that, the first area that I would uh, focus on is really thinking about um, access to healthcare providers. So I mentioned that, you know, we have a number of rural areas um, that just, you know, have a very low number of providers, whether it's site, you know, doctors, pediatricians, psychiatrists, whatever it is. Um, but then also looking at lower income communities and, and places where it's a little harder uh, to maintain that kind of a workforce. So, you know, on the eastern shore of Virginia, um, you know, we have, it's both rural and we have a lot of migrant uh, workers that are over there. So thinking about, again, making sure that we have services that are not just um, applicable uh, from a language perspective, but making sure that they're easily accessible. So that, that's that been an area that that's really important. Uh, but it also means that we have to stay focused on our supply of our healthcare providers. So our focus in this past year has been to look at all of the regulations that we have uh, in our licensing of healthcare providers. So we have about uh, 20 different boards that license um, everything from uh, uh, pediatricians, psychologists, uh, social workers, acupuncturists, um, all across the board. So looking at that to, to ensure that our regulatory requirements are uh, consistent uh, with one, our state laws, uh, but also are consistent with our neighbors. Um, where we can, we have been uh, trying to be part of state compacts that allow uh, individuals who are licensed in other states to come into our state without having to go through uh, new testing requirements. But really thinking about um, looking at some of these areas where there are inequalities uh, uh, to ensure that we are placing doctors, um, that we have scholarship programs for uh, nurses and social workers in those communities, um, and uh, really kind of ramping that up. What we saw uh, through COVID uh, in particular was a real shortage of nurses. And uh, whether it was in a hospital or a health district or just in a community, Every place we went uh, in uh, sort of the end of 2021 and throughout 2022, uh, we heard about about that area. And clearly that, you know, is even exacerbated in lower income communities and things like that. And so in the budget that's uh, being debated, even as I uh, talk today, um, we have a number of programs in there to expand that. We have an Earn to Learn uh, program for nurses. Um, we have programs for social workers, um, for certified nurse assistants. So thinking about the whole range um, through the nursing homes and, and things like that to make sure that we do that. So that that obviously is a huge part. And that's something that, you know, we have been thinking about for quite a while in the United States, that this pipeline of healthcare providers um, was going to narrow. And it certainly has. And that's particularly true as it relates to behavioral health, which I'll I'll get to in a minute. I think the other thing that, you know, has been become really apparent are things like food insecurity. And so thinking about, um, you know, that that's an area where we see a wide range of inequality, but it's also, um, you know, spread out in in particularly in different age groups. I think the that now we're at a stage where we recognize that um, the impact of food insecurity, we always recognize that the impact that it had on, on physical health. But now I think we really noted how impactful it is for mental health and thinking about ensuring that, that people have all of the tools around them uh, to be well. And so I think that that's been really important. We have worked with the Secretary of Agriculture um, and the Secretary of Education to one, um, expand our food uh, programs in schools but really look beyond that to think about um, some of the programs that we have for the aging community um, and then uh, areas of, of great need and, and thinking about that. A similar area is affordable housing. And that is really um, an issue that is, again, sort of uh, not equal throughout the Commonwealth. Um, there are certain areas, North Virginia in particular, um, where affordable housing for lower income individuals uh, is really, really scarce. And so thinking about, um, again, far beyond my secretary getting into 
other parts of, of the government, but thinking about how we can create opportunities in communities throughout the, the Commonwealth of Virginia um, to really expand housing. Um, and in particular for housing for uh, people with mental health conditions who are coming back into the community after being treated, um, affordable housing opportunities or supportive housing opportunities for people with disabilities, uh, which is really, I think, a critical um, advance that we've had in the past several years to look for ways that we can ensure that people with disabilities live as independently as possible, that they live in communities in which they want to live, um, and that we do uh, what we need to do to make sure that that's possible. Um, from an economic standpoint, uh, it's an easy thing. Uh, uh, an individual with a disability who lives in a nursing home uh, costs about $7,7500 per month. A person who lives in their own home or in a group home, uh, around $2,2500. So from the state's perspective, it's economically a good thing to do. But more importantly, I think from a moral perspective um, and a civil rights perspective, I think it's really critical that we look for opportunities to make sure that, that people with disabilities can live um, fully in the community um, to the extent they can. And so when we developed our affordable housing uh, program um, that the governor launched uh, in the summer, um, we also were looking at ways to ensure that that people with disabilities would have an opportunity um, and uh, and that as housing um, developments were being created, that we were looking for for partners, developers that could really do that. So I think that that's really important. An area that's sort of off my secretariat, but clearly has an impact is broadband coverage. And again, that is more often than not a rural versus urban issue, but there are also some lower income communities throughout the, the Commonwealth who really are struggling with, with broadband access. So that is something that we know has a big impact on an abil a person's ability to um, manage their own health. And so I think that that's really critical. Um, beyond that, I, I think probably there there's... Um, Two areas uh, from a healthcare perspective that are that were really critical for us and will continue to be critical through this. And, and one is no surprise, it's something that we have all been struggling with for some time, and that's maternal health and and uh and infant health as well. And so really thinking about this is an area where again, um black mothers and black infants, the the disparity levels continue to be very high. We are slightly better in Virginia than than the U.S. numbers in general, but but still significantly um, higher. Uh, African American woman is three times more likely to have um, both uh, a serious issue in pregnancy or uh, mortality issues or an issue with her baby versus uh, not a, a white woman. And so, looking at ways that we can. Um, really kind of rethink how we approach that. We um, really for sort of the past 25 years, we've been thinking about that. We've been um, having programs that are both pilot programs as well as statewide programs. There's been some movement. Um, you know, last year we extended the uh, coverage under Medicaid for postpartum care for a year, um, which is really good. We have created um, a benefit for doulas who sort of are um, sort of a birth coach uh, for individuals and creating more opportunities for people to have someone to help guide them through their pregnancy. We have um, ramped up some of our Medicaid uh, requirements uh, for uh, prenatal care. Um, but where I think we have a chance to really move the needle on this is is now starting to look at data. So we, you know, we have a lot of these programs. We know a lot of the people that participate in them, but we continue to um, not, we have not had good data that sort of shows uh, the benefits of specific parts of this program um, and the outcomes that we want. And so I think we are probably the first administration and the next administration will have even more of an ability to use data in, in almost a real-time perspective to make sure that the, the initiatives that we have are really tailored uh, to the people that we want to serve. And so using that data, um, you know, having what I would call a lot of little bets, trying a lot of programs across the board, 
um, that are based on both geography and uh, diversity and thinking about um, looking at the data and and figuring out how we can sort of fine tune these programs uh, to do that. So I'm really excited that we can can sort of be in a place where we can measure outcomes more quickly um, rather than sort of a two, three, even five year uh, time frame. So uh, I think there's some some opportunity there. And again, I think there's also a lot of improvement uh, nationwide about how do we approach individuals um, who are at greater risk? What kinds of programs can we have? Um, and more importantly, starting to sort of tie all the things together to make sure whether it's a Medicaid, a health department, commercial plan, that we're really looking at this sort of across the board. Um, probably the largest initiative that we have had this, this year um, has been our mental health uh, uh, initiative, which we call Right Help Right Now. And um, that uh, sort of came at, you know, when the governor um, was, was elected, as he was getting ready to uh, begin his administration, uh, I met with him and, and we talked about uh, mental health. He had actually campaigned on reforming mental health, and I was interested uh, to find out what he meant by that. And um, and so, you know, we talked about what his view was of the services that were being provided in Virginia and the impact that that people had. And And, you know, throughout his campaign, he heard almost every single day from uh, someone, an individual who who had care, who was seeking care, a family member, perhaps someone who had lost someone to uh, suicide or substance use, uh, doctors, law enforcement, people across the board. And, you know, clearly Virginia is not unique. I mean, the United States and really most of the world is really struggling with a significant increase in, in mental health issues, whether it's anxiety or depression or or more serious things or alcohol or, or drug uh, uh, use disorder. I think, you know, we we see that, but um, what we really did was sort of look at how do we approach it in Virginia. And, and taking a step back, uh, we kind of uh, looked at sort of the continuum of care that we have in, in behavioral health. And, and for us, you know, we've been having a conversation bipartisan way over the past 15 years. And, um, I think there's been some some good work that's being done, but we've never really looked at the system in a holistic manner. And so if you do that, you know, you'll see in sort of a simplistic way, kind of bucketed into three areas. So the first would be what I'd call sort of pre-crisis. It's the prevention, the intervention, the maintenance. So helping people who have a minor mental health issue or even a major one, helping them deal with that, address it, perhaps be in recovery, um, but learn to, to manage it. And, and that is really important. It's an area that we have not put a significant amount of resources, but it's an area that we need to. And, um, and you know, really thinking through the new 988, um, uh, we started as a suicide uh, crisis line, but it's become much more than that um, and serving a lot of people with mental health issues, sort of a, a complement to 911. Um, using that in in a more meaningful way. Um, and then the second bucket would be the crisis care. And that's something that we, that's where we usually spend most of our time. Um, and in Virginia, like in a lot of states, um, we hospitalize people um, far too frequently, that we don't have a lot of services before hospitalization, whether it's a crisis receiving care center or a crisis stabilization unit, but looking for ways that you can sort of de-escalate um, the, the care that people are getting to make sure that they get the most appropriate care as quickly as possible. And a lot of times being in an, in a hospital, an emergency room, um, you know, the person is safe, but they're not really getting the care. And then beyond that, you have sort of the post-crisis, the recovery, and that's an area where it goes back to thinking about, you know, do we have the wraparound services? Do we have supportive housing? Do we have supportive employment? Are we looking for ways um, that help people in their community? And, and, and I think it's really important that we get these services in the community that they're as close to the individual, you know, as possible. Um, you know, in, in Virginia, we've seen just sort of an explosion of um, issues among young people. 
And so a lot of the work that we focused on was thinking about, um, you know, young people, uh, kids in in kindergarten through 12th grade, and then kids in, in college and, and that sort of age group, uh, and think about this. But really, you know, mental health issues are sort of every age group, um, as are some of our substance use. So we ended up with sort of focusing on um, six pillars of of how we want to approach it, and and they're pretty straightforward. I mean, the, the you know the first is just you know we we recognize that we have to have. In many states, if you're in crisis, you call 911 and the police come. And our our police have been um, really fantastic. They almost all have been trained in mental health first aid, in crisis intervention. They do great work. But at the end of the day, their job is about safety. And so it's not so much about uh, making sure that you get the care you need or, or de-escalating the crisis. It's making sure that you're safe and people around you are safe. And so you know, what ends up happening a lot of times is that mental health issues become criminal issues. You know, a person in crisis or a person in a drug psychosis uh, hits the cop, attacks another person, and then, you know, they get into the criminal justice system. That makes it very hard for them to really ever be in recovery. So a lot of the work we want to do is sort of reducing the, the work that law enforcement is doing and looking for ways to um, sort of decriminalize the mental health issues. Um, we know that we have to significantly improve um, the resources that we have um, in our current budget, um, which was passed last year. The legislature and the governor added $430 million of new spending uh, for behavioral health. Um, this year, we asked to add $230 million to that. So we have a total of $660 million, um, which we think will allow us to, to really improve the system, but put resources in the pre-crisis section and in the uh, post-crisis area, not just focus on, on the crisis part. Um, we also know we have to really step up our work on substance use disorder. And, uh, and that's an issue that kind of came up during the, the pandemic. You know, many more people were using drugs. Um, the opioid epidemic, you know, did not, uh, did not stop during the pandemic. Last year in Virginia, we had 2,600 uh, fatal overdoses. The majority of those were fentanyl-based. And so looking at ways that we can address both fentanyl and other drugs uh, in our system, I think, will be really critical. Um, again, going back to um, really sort of stepping up and making the behavioral health workforce a priority, and then looking for ways that we can put um, service innovations and best practices into the work that we do. Um, particularly using our Medicaid program. Uh, we have about 2.2 million Virginians um, out of 8.7 who are on Medicaid. So using that program and making sure that the behavioral health services um, that are there are, are really critical. So I think that's sort of, you know, going to be something we, the governor announced that this is a, you know, first of a three-year initiative. So today, this year, we asked for a number of things. We will continue to grow this over the next three years and uh, and hopefully, you know, uh, be a leader uh, throughout the, the country as far as we as we focus on that. The last thing I want to talk about briefly is we have had a, a pilot in Petersburg, Virginia. Petersburg is about 20 minutes south of Richmond. And on virtually every single indicator, whether it's life expectancy, whether it's cancer, you know, stage four cancer, whether it's um, uh, infant uh, death, preterm delivery, um, crime, every single indicator, Petersburg is the lowest of um, the, the, the rest of Virginia. And uh, the governor visited it a couple of times during his campaign and then, and then since then. And uh, the governor asked us to have a pilot down there. So we have six different secretaries with about 70 different initiatives um, that are going on. Our, our focus is not to replace local government, but rather walk alongside them um, and work together 
to really improve both the services that are delivered as well as the outcomes. And so for us, looking at the opportunity to be in the community to build more primary care services, um, to have community health workers there who are uh, from the community, um, who know the people in the community, I think those are opportunities where we can really improve the health outcomes there. Um, clearly, there is a law enforcement perspective in making sure that the community is safe. Um, Petersburg is on um, the I-95 um, highway system, and so a lot of the drugs that are coming from the southern border north come through there. So there's been a lot more um, gang activity and, and crime, and so looking for ways that we can really uh, make those communities safe. You know, people aren't going to go out and go to the doctors if if they don't feel it's going to be safe. And so that, that's that been an area we have seen, I think, some real improvement. When we look at, um, from a, a healthcare perspective, I think one of the things that uh, is both a, a challenge and an opportunity for us is that uh, in talking to the, the people that live there, there's a, sort of a sense of learned hopelessness or learned helplessness meaning that, you know, people weren't born to believe that, you know, I'm going to get diabetes and die, or I'm going to get heart disease and die, or I'm going to get shot and die, and there's not much I can do about it. Um, it's that sense of being in a community, seeing that happen to your neighbors, not feeling that you have any agency or control over it, um, that leads to that. And so for us, um, and, and you can see that in areas where there are, um, you know, less good health outcomes across the board. It's not just in Petersburg, but there are other places. And so one, it's a, it's a challenge to overcome that. And I think for us, the way that we are doing that, again, goes to having people from the community be in the community, uh, helping connect people to the right care, whether it's a a nurse or a pharmacy or a doctor, just making sure that people understand that we have a lot of willing partners there, the hospital, the healthcare systems, other, other groups are, are engaged in that. But thinking through that, and then I think our opportunity is that when we get to that place, when we figure out you know, how we can help individuals get the agency, the ability to control that themselves, I think we have really made, you know, an improvement in how people will get care. And so when I think about inequalities and and sort of sort of summing up that, when I think about how we approach that and how we can improve life expectancy and and the quality of life, it's again going to be about how we create this personal agency, how we create an opportunity for people to be in control of that. And so it is not going to be you know, the government is here and we're going to solve this for you, but rather thinking about, you know, how, how do we ensure that people are aware of the services that are out there, um, that people have access to those, those services, um, that the services are perhaps not equal, but at least there is some uh, consistent minimum standard across the board. Um, and so, you know, making sure that all of the services that we provide, whether it's um, health care, social services, uh, community services, mental health services, substance use services. I think that that is the goal is to to be in a place where we are ensuring that people have access, that it's easily understandable and accessible, uh, but also that they have the ability to um, be in control of that and understand how to do that. And so some of it is something as simple as, um, there are very few cancer checks, cancer screenings that go on in Petersburg. And again, a lot of people there believe I'm going to get cancer and there's not much I can do about it. When in fact, with most cancers, there's a lot you can do about it. And so when we look at the screenings and we see how low they are for prostate screening and they're lower for breast cancer screening and other screenings, and we compare that to the higher incidence of stage three and stage four cancer, we, that creates a real opportunity and in, in many ways a pretty easy one um, to get in the community and uh, and get those things, um, get those tests done. Again, it's not just going to be the state health department, you know, rolling through with a, a mobile screening unit. It's going to be working with trusted voices, 
um, who are are known and respected in the community uh, to get things done. So I'm really excited about the opportunity that we have, um, whether it's you know working with groups that are are focused on on healthy births or all the way up to uh, the groups in, in the Commonwealth that are focused on the aging population. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to look for ways to make Virginia the best place to live, work, and raise a family. So thank you again for, for the time. I wish I could be uh, there to be part of the conversation, um, but I wish you well.